Hello. Welcome to our museum moment. Hopefully you are getting this live or in the future. And um, we're excited to talk with you today. My name is Ellie Gettinger. I'm the Education Director at Jewish Museum Milwaukee. And I am here to talk about baseball. We're not seeing it played. Well, unless you're watching, you know, the uh, Major League Network and you're watching old games, we're not, we're missing all of this feeling of early spring and the, the, the feeling of possibility that everybody's a champion and everyone's going to make it to the World Series. And of course, we in Milwaukee really felt like this might be the Brewers year. They had put together a really great team last year. We're all excited for the exciting return of Christian Yelich and we're kind of on pause. So while we're on pause, I wanted to explore a little bit of Milwaukee's baseball history in my cave down here um, and give you a sense of that. And like so many stories that I start with, I start with immigration. Um, and in sharing a story about immigration, it gets us to baseball. So the first thing that I wanted to share with you today was a Bintel brief. Bintel briefs were uh, letters to the editor in the Jewish Daily Forward. And it really originated the idea of, not letters to the editor, sorry, advice column. It originated the idea of something like Dear Abby and Ann Landers. They actually got this from Bintel Brief. Both of them had uh, had seen these in their house growing up. They were sisters, so they, uh, and they adapted it for a national audience. So Bintel Brief, though, its role was to take in questions from new immigrants and respond to them and give them a sense of what life in America was like. Um, and it's all in Yiddish, so this is translated. Um, and this is actually text that comes to us from an exhibit we had a couple of years ago called Chasing Dreams that's from the National Museum of Jewish American History. Um, they actually have a lot of these materials online, so I'll share those after this and you can check it out. And the question was, should children play baseball? And here is the question. One should teach their child how to play chess or checkers, or at least a game that sharpens the mind. That would be appreciated. But what value does a game like baseball have? Nothing more than becoming crippled comes out of it. I want my boy to, be, to grow up to be a mensch, not a wild runner. He also in this article points out that in Russia, it would have been crazy if you saw like a teenage boy running around and playing tag. And in America, you see grown men doing it. So the response from Abraham Kahan, the editor of The Forward, is this. Let your boys play baseball and even become outstanding players as long as it doesn't interfere with their studies and doesn't put them in bad company. Let's not raise our children to be foreigners in their own country. An American who isn't agile and strong in hands and feet uh, in his entire body is not an American. Unfortunately, these qualities have more value than the true assets of a citizen. Raise your children as educated and thoughtful, as people filled with true heritage of humanity and fellowship for which they are ready to fight. And they should also be healthy and agile youth who shouldn't feel inferior to others. So baseball is going to be the great equalizer. Baseball is the way to go and become American. And that really is one of the central roles that baseball plays in kind of exposing many different uh, types of people to kind of the broader American experience. But let's go back and do a little bit about one particular immigrant, an immigrant who came of age. Her name was uh, Marie Huber. She was born in 1904 in Russia. And in 1907, she comes to Milwaukee. I'm unclear entirely why she comes to Milwaukee. She's educated here. And at a time when many women aren't going to college, she actually goes to Milwaukee's Teachers College and becomes a teacher. Um, so good for Marie Huber. She gets married to a car dealer, and they set aside having a family. Now, Marie Huber who loves, loves, loves baseball. She loves baseball so much, so much that when one of her sons is in high school, they take a six week trip to New York to see the Yankees and uh, the Giants and uh, the Dodgers at that point in 1949. So you can imagine the, the talent that they're seeing, DiMaggio and Jackie Robinson and just how amazing that would be. They go and see museums and operas too. She is really an equal opportunity um, explorer of community culture and civics and things like that. But this is important to her. Baseball is one of the things that she is passionate for. When her son is in 
Um, her, she and her son, before there is a Milwaukee professional baseball team, um, major league team, they go to Borchert Field. Borchardt Field was the kind of first big institution. Milwaukee had professional baseball from the 1860s. Rufus King actually was responsible for organizing one of the first um, uh, leagues in Milwaukee. So you get Rufus King forming this. And in 1888, you have what is initially called, I think, Milwaukee Athletic Field becomes Borchardt Field. And it is built like a bathtub. So you can imagine how bad the, um, the actual visibility is and in fact the kind of word on the street was that to get visibility in Borchardt Field you needed two tickets just to make sure you could go slide in either direction and the original team that's playing or the minor league team is the Milwaukee Brewers one of the owners is a guy named uh, Bill Veek and Bill Veek tries anything to get people in the gates he gives away livestock during World War II he has um First, he has games at eight in the morning because people coming off of third shift would just come to the game. Um, and he would do all sorts of things. They also, at Borchardt Field, um, the, the Negro League played there too. So while the games weren't integrated, the field itself was an integrated field, um, which is a pretty cool aspect. So Marie and her son would go and watch games there. They were excited about it. Um, and they were de devoted baseball fans to the extent that when Marie's son was the president of this fraternity in um, Madison, and there was a moment in which uh, the Braves were playing in a, uh, in, a, in a game at that point, the team is the Milwaukee Braves. Um, she has her transistor radio tuned into the game and the son is giving a speech and halfway through the speech, she yells out, Adcock hit a grand slam. That is how passionately devoted to baseball she is. Now, of course, many of you have probably surmised whose mother I'm talking about. I'm talking about Bud Selig's mother. And the reason Bud Selig loves baseball, the reason he became this incredible advocate for, this, for baseball in Milwaukee is because his mother raised him that way. And I think it's a really fascinating, fabulous story of how people learn to love something. Like he said, you know, without his mother, this wouldn't have been his, the game that he, uh, you know, that he bet his whole career on. When the Braves leave town, and Bud Selig had been a minority owner at that point as well of the Braves, when they leave town, he then takes all of his stake in the Braves and he puts, incorporates it into um, a Milwaukee Baseball Incorporated to bring baseball back to Milwaukee. And actually, we are at an amazing time right now because tomorrow, April 1st, is the 50th anniversary of when that deal went through. April 1st, 1970, the deal goes through and the Seattle Pilots come to Milwaukee and become the Milwaukee Brewers. So it's a 50th anniversary celebration tomorrow, and I'm excited to be part of it. Even if I can't go watch them play at Miller Park or whatever it's being called, I think it's still Miller Park for a year. Um, but... This is what we're celebrating today. A couple other things just to note is that baseball in Milwaukee has only has had this story tradition. In fact, we've never not had baseball being played here at this time, with the exception of the four years when the Braves were missing. Um, so I think we're all in a little bit of that kind of place. I imagine Marie Selig would have felt this way too. She made it once uh, Bud brought the, bought the Brewers. She would move to Arizona every year for spring training, and she'd be there for all six weeks of spring training, watching the Brewers, getting them ready. One kind of really sad story about this is during the 1982 World Series in St. Louis, she broke her hip going into the game, and she was adamant, I'm not go leaving the stadium. I'm going to watch the game, and the only way they got her to go to a hospital is by saying that there would be a TV there. So I love this kind of fandom. Bud so beloved here is the fact that he really was a fan of the game. He was a fan first. And you saw that in the way that he took the highs and the lows of the game and, and felt them. Um, he became commissioner in 1998 and is the first uh, commissioner emeritus, which shows you just his kind of eminence in the game. And as I said before, I really think it's a reflection of, of, of an appreciation of what his mother put out there. He said, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, he said, 
my mother loved the game of baseball and my dad lived with it. <laughs> so thank you so much. I'm going to post a couple of things on our, um, on the uh, Facebook comments after this, including uh, the article from the Vintel Brief. I also have another article from the 1920s about um, a manager, the manager of the Giants, who was saying, or sorry, the general owner of the uh, the Giants, who was saying if he could find a Jewish talent, he would pay $100,000 for it because his sense was 50% of all New York baseball fans were Jewish. Um, I'll also share a couple of other things, uh, just some articles we found about Bud and his mom, which were just fabulous. And continue to share your stories of baseball. What do you love? What are you missing right now? What is the thing that you wish you could be tailgating? Uh, let us know. And if you're enjoying these museum moments, and I hope you are, please consider making a small donation to support the museum and all of its programs. Thanks very much. And I will see you on Thursday when we are going on the flip side of April 1st and looking at uh, the Abrams brother, uh, sorry, Jim Abrams, the Zucker brothers, and Dick Chudnow and the founding of the Kentucky Fried Theater in Madison. Have a great day and I'll see you next time.